Thank you guys for joining. Uh, we're here to talk about mastering LLM delivery in private clouds, a journey to seamless deployments, mostly with Kubernetes and OCI. And for those of you who are familiar with Cohere, we do have a relationship with another OCI. We're talking about open container initiative, not Oracle Cloud infrastructure, but hey, our Oracle Cloud friends, we, we like you guys too. So. Uh, before we get started, let me give you an intro. So my name is Autumn Mulder. I'm the Director of Infrastructure and Security at Cohere. We build large language models. Yes, we put LLM in the title of the talk, mostly to just bring you all here. Uh, I won't spoil what the talk actually is about, but we will talk about LLMs a little bit. Uh, we build foundational models. We help, uh, help companies that are looking to deploy and use this tech in their enterprise. And then to talk us through some of the challenges we have. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marwan. I am a member of technical staff at Cohere. Um, previously, I worked on the Azure Kubernetes service team at Microsoft, and more recently at the company formerly known as Twitter. I've contributed to a lot of several CNCF projects in the past, so it's super exciting for me to see the foundational role CNCF is doing with the success of the new kid on the block, large language models. And we can't wait to share with you our journey. So without further ado, I'll hand it back to Autumn. All right, thanks, Marvin. So I'll just tee this up a little bit. Uh, before we get started, I like to know who I'm talking to. So raise of hands, who's a site reliability engineer or identifies as such. Okay, we've got a few of you. Thank you, one on the stage, thank goodness. Uh, data scientist, MLEs out there. Oh, good number, all right. I have no idea what the rest of you are here for, but I hope you find something valuable out of our conversation. Awesome. So really briefly, most of you probably know this because you saw the word LLM in the talk of the title, but what is a large language model? Um, in a nutshell, I asked our large language model, this is what it is. You know, it's a way you can talk to computers uh, with natural language. Um, my favorite definition, to be honest, is this one. Uh, it's a pile of linear algebra on disk. So for those of you who are infrastructure engineers, uh, that's kind of relevant because we're just dealing with uh, files, right? Files on disk that store the, the probabilities. So we'll talk about the LLM serving stack briefly just to anchor this conversation and then uh, and before we get to the, the technical challenges. So, this is, this is pretty high level. Um, when we're talking about the system components for LLM stack, it's, it's very similar to any other system that you're running. So you have a kind of surrounding pieces, the observability layer, the persistence layer, artifact management. I mean, this is, this is what you get when you have to serve any kind of system. Uh, in the middle here, we have what are our CPU-based services. So we have our rate limiting, our authentication, endpoints and routing, um, batching and queuing, which actually turns out to be a really important problem when you're dealing with, with large language models. Uh, but these are all CPU-based workloads that we run on, on GKE. And then we have over here on the le right, sorry, your right, uh, we have the, the models, and these are our GPU-based workloads, which is where a lot of interesting challenges come into play. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is it. This is, our, this is our SaaS system. This is kind of what we started out as, uh, as a company, because we, we started out small, you know, we're a startup. Uh, a lot of the systems that we, that we built had some pretty key dependencies on, on GCP, because that's how you, how you start going. But, um, what we found was in the market, there's a strong need to run private LLMs. Uh, so just real quick, why do companies need a private LLM? I think most of you can probably guess, but this is similar to when, uh, as, a, as an industry, we started moving into the cloud, like all the same reasons that people uh, gave for, I can't move to out of my co-located facility into the cloud. It's the, it's the exact same reasons we're hearing for why I need to run a private LLM and don't want to use a SaaS system. So it's compliance and security controls. You know, you have those built up, you want to use them, uh, and you want those to, to apply to any LLMs that you're building for, uh, for your system. Um, you've got data volumes and latency are pretty, pretty key problems. So if you're, if you're shoving a lot of data to the LLM, you need that co-located with the rest of your infrastructure to just kind of drop latency, um, or you don't want to page large data egress costs. And then 
uh, for those who are infrastructure engineers, you know that it's really nice to have a single plane of availability uh, to, to monitor availability, to monitor reliability, and just bring that all into, into one place. So these are a lot of the challenges we were hearing from companies who were saying we don't want to use a SaaS-provided system, but we also don't have the expertise to run uh, a fully open source uh, stack, and this is just kind of an evolving space, so we want, we want help. So as a, as a leadership team, we brought the, the challenge to our external infrastructure team. Uh, we've got the rest of the crew, crew here today, and then, then Marwan. Um, it was a really great group effort to figure out how do you take the system running on our SaaS environment and make it really easy for us to, to deploy into private environments. So to walk through those challenges and solutions, Marwan. Thanks, Autumn. Um, so, one of the first challenges we've hit was our dependency on managed services. So, we were a startup, we're trying to move fast, so we took a lot of dependencies on GCP-specific components in areas such as observability and persistence. And we found out that when we started looking at our code, that effectively it did a lot of assumption that it's running in GCP. It was super tightly coupled to the GCP SDK as well. So, what we need to do is, first of all, make our stack cloud agnostic, right? So, that means is, we need to figure out what you're gonna do with the managed services, and then we need to make sure that this stack can run on other multiple targets as well. So the first lessons we've learned is to invest in abstractions and invest in those abstractions early. So for services such as databases and PubSub, you want a uniform API that is independent of the underlying implementation. And in some cases, you might also wanna have those interactions behind a separate microservice. When we started looking at our code, um, a lot of it, a lot of the functions and the objects, they had a lot of configuration options that were specific to our use case. So we had things like analytics code, billing code, and feature flagging libraries as well. Not all of those things are going to be um, relevant for every single customer. So we needed to simplify our service configuration APIs. So that's where the functional options pattern came in handy. So it's a creational design pattern that lets you build complex structure using constructor that can take zero or more functions and those functions end up modifying the return state um, that you return to the consumers. So with that function, we're actually easily able to define different options for our private cloud deployments, as well as our um, SaaS deployments. So we're easily able to turn off feature flagging for those private cloud configurations. And also made it super easy for us to define new options without modifying the existing constructor code, because all you need to do is to define the new um, options interface. The second lesson we've learned is not to reinvent the wheel. It can be tempting sometimes to define your own abstractions over common operations, but there's no need to do so um, when solutions already exist. So for object storage, we relied on Thanos object store library, which abstracts a lot of the operations over common storage backends. And instead of having to worry about the specifics of persistent storage and the implementation of storage devices, we required a user provided read write many PVC as part of the application configuration. So that PVC we mostly use for storing um, the large model weights um, as an optimization to avoid having to redownload them during auto scaling. For metrics, uh, most of our code was instrumented from day one with Prometheus metrics and it's the de facto tool in the industry, so we didn't really need to do much there. And for logging, there's a lot of exporters out there that convert between proprietary and open source formats. And finally, um, we try to rely on workload identity whenever, whenever possible because it simplifies the integration between Kubernetes service accounts as well as IAM service accounts. So that's what we started with. You can see all the GCP specific blocks there. And it turns out all you need to do is just very little few abstractions and then you're halfway there. But we haven't really talked about the artifact management layer. And for us, our most valuable artifact is our model weights. So we needed a solution to deliver our model weights securely into private cloud um, scenarios. We can, roll, we can roll our own storage service. The issue with that is you need to worry about authentication and security. You also need to worry about scalability. And finally, you need to worry about the cost. So I'm gonna take a quick break from the lessons and deep dive into how we design our model weights delivery solution. So the first thing we considered is creating signed URLs. So it's a good solution but signed URLs are quite limited in nature because they have short expiration times. And they only need to be for exact object URIs. And our model weights were quite large. So we had model weights that were more than 100 gigabytes. So in order to deliver a solution using that approach, you need to create a unique URL per customer, per file, per model, which isn't really quite scalable. The second option we considered was to deliver those artifacts directly into the customer's object storage. 
So we can use workload at NT Federation to give them access to our you know, storage backend, and then um, they can pull the weights directly from our end. The issue with that is that it requires a lot of manual setup, and it's complex setup to do. It's also not supported in all cloud providers. And finally, it's obviously not supported in on-prem. So that solution wasn't really a viable thing for us. The third option was to bundle our model weights with the container images. So our application consists mostly of serving images as well as the container weights, and that effectively what makes um, the LLM stack. So we thought, okay, we can just bundle the model weights in the same container image as well. And if the users can pull the container images, they can pull the model weights. So for container images specifically, we relied on a reverse proxy that is sitting on top of our Google Artifact Registry. So reverse proxy is um, connected to the Artifact Registry through a service account that gives it authorized access to pull those, Im those images. And then the customers can talk to this reverse proxy using the license key to pull those images through. And we relied on Replicated as a commercial product, but part of them is you know, the licensing API plus the reverse proxy side of things. The issue with that approach is it's less flexible because of the tight coupling int introduces between the application layer as well as the model weights. Our model weights have generally a quicker release cadence, and the fact that we have to create the same image every time we want to release a model weight wasn't really flexible. The other issue is that it negates the optimizations we did with the NFS cache um, for quicker auto-scaling of models. So you end up like, you know, being, not being able to scale as fast. And finally, because of the size of those images, bundled with you know, the serving images, which are already quite large, plus the model weights, patching um, critical vulnerabilities takes a while. So we took a look at that and, okay, it seems that we already have a mechanism to deliver container images. Is there a way where we can use the same mechanism to deliver the model waste and achieve the desired decoupling? And that's where OCR artifacts come into place. So lesson three is OCR artifacts are a very powerful standard, like really powerful. Um, the, for those who are not familiar with OCR artifacts, they are a way to utilize OCI compliant registries to store arbitrary files. And because you're utilizing the same infrastructure as containers, you end up consolidating the security and the management efforts into a single solution. The community standard, um, the community usage of OCR artifacts is still evolving, but we, leave, well, we believe they have strong potential as a generic artifact store. And registries can be really a very good generic artifact store. So I'm going to deep dive into how we used OCR artifacts to build our model waste solution. So we used the open source project Aorus. Aorus is the de facto tool in handling and managing OCR artifacts. I like Aorus a lot. I almost named my cat Aorus. Um, the focus on Aorus is on generic artifacts, so it never assumes that you're dealing with a container image. It always assumes you're dealing with a generic artifact type. It has a very rich API and library support for building custom registry clients to handle different media types. And I'll dive a bit into like, some of what those terminologies mean. So when we start working with Aorus, um, the first thing we thought about is we can just you know, give, the, give ORS the model weight directory and then you know, tell it ORS push and then it's gonna push things into the OCR artifact registry. What that ends up doing is it's going to create a single atomic layer as you know, like one entity and then it's going to create a tarball and mark that for extraction on download. And this is what a manifest looks like built with that approach. So as you can see, this looks like a typical container image manifest, but the media type is different. And you can define any media type you'd like there. Um, you can think of a media type as similar to when you, know, when you do an HTTP request and you specify the content type to be application JSON, the client itself knows how to handle this particular media type. Uh, when you create an artifact with ORAS, um, passing it a folder, you'll see that it adds two annotations there. So one of them is the Deus um, unpack true, and that marks the, file, the folder for extraction <laughs> after download. And the second one is effectively just a directory name where you know, this particular blob will be extracted. The issue with that is it's because it's a single layer, you aren't really gaining any parallelization efforts. Like the entire blob is going to be serialized, which was way much slower than um, using object storage. So we needed to, to do better. So the second thing we did was what if we bin pack our entire model waste into separate smaller folders and then pass it to ORS um, to upload this? So first of all, we tried to you know, separate the folders into the entire model waste into smaller different folders. So we create subfolders that are like you know, suffix with a certain number. And then we, for example, if you have a model weight of size 100 gigs, you end up creating 20 folders of you know, size 5 gigs. The issue with that, though, is 
on extraction, your entire directory tree, your entire folder structure is different. So you need a way to essentially rebuild the structure post-download. And that's where ORUS Rich Library comes into play. So ORUS has this post-copy callback that you can hook into post descriptor download. So after a certain blob is downloaded, you can do a particular action there. So it seems like the process is easy, right? We just hook into this post-copy callback and then say, okay, everything you downloaded here, just shift it up one directory. And that would restore the model weight um, structure as it was before. But we still need a way to tell ORUS that, you know, you need to actually do this process. So remember the annotations I showed you before. It turns out you can define any custom annotation you'd like on this um, artifact layer, and then you can define any other operations you'd like based on that. So this is what our manifests look like with that approach. So we still have the same media type, and then you notice at the bottom there's this annotation that says move up, and this annotation is very specific to our implementation of the ORS client that says, okay, once I see this annotation, I need to shift everything up one directory. And then the rest of the manifest is just those layers duplicated where every layer is just one portion of the model weights. So that's a typical interaction with the ORS API. So you first create a bunch of file descriptors and then you add annotations to those and then you pass it to ORS and say, okay, pack these layers with these particular annotations and then the download process is simple. On download, we just check if this annotation exists and then we move the folders up the directory tree to rebuild the, the structure. So some of you might be asking, we've had binary distribution formats and blob storage APIs for years and they're just out there and supported. Why do we need another you know, support for a container API? Well, it turns out there's a lot of benefits you gain from using OCI and ORUS. Uh, for us, the main benefit is we were able to ship a solution really quickly in you know, less, less than two months actually, um, because it turns out that all you really need to stand up a Kubernetes environment is a container registry. That's really the only real dependency you have out there, more or less. Um, it also unlocked a bunch of other benefits for us. And most of those benefits relate to that container registries or registries in general are content addressable. Um, so the first thing that it unlocked for us, it provided a way to ensure the authenticity and integrity of the image contents. So because every layer gets its own digital fingerprint, um, any simple, mod any modification to this particular layer would result in a different hash. So developers are actually able to easily validate if an image has been tampered with or not. The second thing is thinking of model weights as you know, image layers unlocked a lot of encryption scenarios for us. Instead of having to encrypt the entire model weights and then you know, take the hit on the download time, we can just pick a random layer from this manifest and decide to encrypt that. And that essentially avoids the problem of you having to encrypt the full thing. The third thing is because of the content addressable nature of container registries and the fact that if a layer has been stored before, it's not going to be uploaded again. If you build your model waste in a certain way to ensure that you know, unique layers are just not duplicated there, um, you end up having a bunch of like storage cost reductions. Uh, so if you're smart about it, because if a layer already exists in a registry similar to like if a container layer already exists in a registry, it's not gonna be pulled again. And that's done through like digital fingerprinting and the SHA stuff that is um, known in like container registries. Um, ORS itself has built-in retries for failed layer downloads. So if a particular layer fails to download, it's not going to undo all the work it's done before. It's only going to be retrying this particular layer. And all of that comes for free with just using ORS. You don't really need to have any custom retry logic or anything built in there. Another thing is because you can pre-inspect the, the, the manifest of an artifact, you're able to do a bunch of smart things. So for us, for example, uh, we use Triton inference servers heavily and the Triton config you know, is a file that tells Triton server like how to perform certain things. We try and store the Triton config as a separate layer on this um, artifact. So we're actually able to like pull that before and do some changes to support running on different hosts, different batch configs, and so on. It also unlocked an easier path to air gap for us. Because I mentioned before, a registry is really the only dependency you need. AirGap customers can just replicate both our container images and model ways directly um, into the registries, and that's all they need to um, spin up our application, as well as obviously like a Helm chart as well, which again, Helm charts can also be stored in OCI artifacts. So it turns out like all the problem effectively just simplified into using a vendor neutral um, OCI registry. So we got rid of the GCS dependency there, and that's all we needed to simplify our artifact delivery solution. And I'll hand it back to Autumn. 
This is literally me giving him a chance to take a drink of water. But I think I warned you, we uh, put LLM in the title, but really this is our love letter to OCI and Oris. It's a great, great set of standards. And it was a really fun engineering challenge to, to talk through. So uh, yeah, so once we once we dealt with kind of this first few set of challenges that, that Marwan walked through, um, you know, we dealt with the observability side, we dealt with persistence, we dealt with artifact storage. And so now we had to get to the actual uh, kind of core set of challenges that are specific to um, models in general, LLMs uh, specifically, but dealing with GPUs. So what we found is there's a lot of challenges uh, when you're talking about going across clouds, across providers uh, for GPUs, because we, we don't just talk about like the four main clouds. We're also talking about uh, on-prem scenarios. We're talking about uh, specialized providers that, that, you know, are kind of hyperscaling and building out GPU specific uh, data centers, that kind of thing. So uh, what we found was there was two main areas of challenge. One is just provisioning the GPUs in a way that you don't have to like build a, uh, you know, a giant tree, decision tree that says, am I running in this GPU, this provider, then, you know, use these configurations, yada, yada, yada. So that provisioning is, is a non-insignificant challenge that we'll talk through. Um, and then the other is just dealing with kind of small scale versus large scale. So as a SaaS provider, obviously we're dealing with GPUs at, at large scale, both between our kind of internal infrastructure team that's dealing with uh, like super clusters, but then our external infrastructure team that has the SaaS system, and we're de you know we're dealing with a lot more GPUs than just like a few. Um, in our private deployment scenarios, we have customers who need you know need to to spin up a lot of replicas, and so they kind of start to approach some of the challenges that we hit dealing at large scale. But then many uh, many of our clients just you know, they're talking in tens of GPUs. They're not, they're not dealing with a, a lot of GPUs. And so the, the challenges you hit are kind of different. Um, and so, so learning some of those lessons was, was interesting. So Marwan, I'll hand it back. Hello again. Um, yeah, so first lesson that relates to GPUs is that provisioning GPUs reliably is tricky. So first you need some host level components such as the NVIDIA drivers. And then you need some Kubernetes-specific components like the device plugin, and maybe a DC gem exporter if you care at all about GPU metrics. Um, the issue with that is there is an implicit ordering dependency between both. If you try and run the NVIDIA device plugin before your drives are ready, you're, it's likely going to crash. And then if you have alerts configured, that's going to cause a lot of alerting noise for you. And then what we found that is different providers do this process differently. So for the longest time, well, they're supporting it now, but for the longest time, GCP let you manage the driver themselves, yourself, and then they manage the device plugin for you. And AKS adopt a different approach where they have a pre-built VHD as an option with all those bits installed, or you can also just run your own device plugin as well. There's a solution for that, but it's not quite there yet. It's the NVIDIA GPU operator. It's not quite there yet because it's not supported across um, certain operating systems, specifically the cost um, operating system if you're on GCP. Um, the next lesson is inconsistent identifiers. And with that, I particularly mean the device name. So the device name returned by the NVML can be different in certain scenarios. And this is important to us because uh, we use Triton for inference, and we have different um, batching configs. We use dynamic batching feature in Triton to optimize for throughput, and we have different um, batching configs depending on the GPU instance you're running in. And the way those are, are defined is it's a combination of the model name as well as the GPU type you're running on. Um, well, you found that if your cloud provider is using PCIe versus um, SXMP, so PCI Express versus SXMP on the physical interconnect, you can get a different device name. So for the same A100 ADG node, you might end up getting um, the first one if you're running on Azure or the second one if you're running in GCP. And at this point, our parsing logic failed, so the batching configs didn't really work in different environments. So we had to work around that and account for the fact that you know, device streams return can be different. The next one is regarding node labels, Kubernetes node labels. So node labels are important because you use node labels to bin pack your workloads and try and control the scheduling properties there. But it turns out there's really no uniform way of knowing if you're running on an A100 versus a D4, for example, without hard coding or without knowing what the, you know, the VM name or the host name is gonna be in advance. Um, some providers have an accelerator label, like GC GKE does it, Azure does it, but the value is not super consistent. So there really isn't a uniform way to do you know, to define that today. The GPU feature discovery project 
tries and solve this problem where it essentially adds a bunch of labels that are retrieved from the host on the node, but you're bound to hit the previous problem I mentioned because the device name return can be inconsistent. So we had to sort of like ensure that our application is flexible enough with templating that the customer is able to provide their own you know, unique set of labels and values as well. So node upgrades. Um, everyone loves node upgrades, I think. Um, you, they usually work most of the time. Um, for GPU workloads, there's kind of like a unique set of challenges there. You can do surge upgrades, but striking the right balance between availability and speed is tricky. And ideally, if you want no downtime, you do a blue-green strategy where you, know, you, create the new node, you create a new node pool on the new version, and then you move the workloads there, let it soak for a bit, and then delete uh, the old pool after. But GPUs are expensive, right? And you're not guaranteed GPU availability. So a blue-green upgrade scenario, while it may work sometimes, most of the time it's, it's going to fail. Well, we found out that it's best, the best approach to upgrades for GPU workloads specifically that have large count is to create a new node pool on the new version. And then for the old pool, to attain that pool to ensure nothing else is going to get on it. And if you're using autoscaler, you set the maximum nodes to one. And that's, what that's going to do is it ensures that the autoscaler isn't going to try and scale up this node pool again. And then you let HPA do its work. So like over time, which can be like a week or more, as your model, as you get like pod churns, all the new workloads are going to be scheduled on the new pool. And at that point in time, you can safely delete the old pool. It's not ideal, but we found that that's probably like the safest approach um, we've come across. And speaking of autoscaling, so autoscaling LLMs is challenging. Um, I worked on a cluster autoscaler in the past. There's bunch of hacky assumptions about how GPUs work. So for example, there used to be a hard-coded delay before the autoscaler issues a request for scaling um, a particular GPU requesting workload. So that delay was hard-coded. It was 30 seconds. Thankfully, there's a fixed upstream now that essentially allows you to configure this value. But the main motivation back then was to make sure you're not overscaling or like overspending for GPUs. But in some cases, if you have capacity reservations or if you're guaranteed GPU availability, then you don't really need this artificial delay added. The second thing is backup delays can lead to long scale up times. So when autoscaler fails to scale up a node pool, it goes into backup mode. And the backup is exponential backup. It's, it starts with five minutes. It can go up to 30 minutes. But it only resets this exponential backup duration after three hours. But during that point in time, you may end up getting capacity due to other workloads downscaling. So you kind of want to be able to configure this backup um, parameters. So we found what's best is to try and like tweak those autoscaler parameters regarding backoff, as well as obviously generally the autoscaler parameters to fit your workload and to fit the nature of your workloads. And so on the autoscaler point, we've had quite a journey to decide what metric we use to horizontally scale our LLM workloads. So first instinct would be to look at delays like latency, like request latency. We tried this for a while. Um, the metric is not ideal because with LLMs, there's, there's really is no way to determine the output or like how long the LLM output is going to take. An LLM can just keep generating things forever. It depends on like the context lens. It depends on like what the user specifies with like max tokens and so on. So it's not really a uniform way to scale on. Um, and obviously different models have different response times. The second metric was the GPU utilization um, and duty cycle. Well, again, sorry, back to the first point, the issue with the first metric as well, it doesn't really take GPU utilization into account. So we're like, okay, let's try and look at GPU utilization. The issue is that different models behave differently. So embed models are flops bound, and GPT generative models are memory bound. So looking at the duty cycle, a high or low value doesn't really give you um, a generic, an indication in the generic case. So we moved past this, and then we looked at the inference um, server queue time. So Triton exposes a bunch of metrics on its queue that we tried to scale on. The issue with that is it's a local view, and it only tells you, um, you know, a particular instance of an inference server has a long queue. It doesn't really give you a global view of the system. So what you found best for us is to essentially, because we had a batching component in play there, we could have a more distributed global view of the system looking at the number of batches that are currently running as well as the number of batches being queued. And using that, we built a heuristic that we scale on. Using that metric actually allowed us to improve GPU utilization, and we were actually able to serve the same um, using almost half, same traffic using almost half the GPUs, as well as tolerate spikes and like traffic latencies a lot more gracefully. 
now we're basically at the end here, but like in summary, right, we've kind of got this, this broad system and by, we got, by the time we got to the end of uh, figuring out how to take everything into a private deployment, you know, we'd come across a few, few challenges that, and uh, lessons, right? So these are just common things, right? Anybody, anybody's gonna have to deal with those challenges when they're going cross cloud. Um, obviously we had some unique challenges around, uh, around how to deliver like large artifacts uh, regularly. And, and that was a really fun, fun engineering problem. And then just last, GPUs are not as well tested or, uh, you know, battle won as, uh, as CPUs, but I think that'll, that'll continue to get better as we go on. So thank you, we appreciate you coming and uh, I think we have five minutes. <laughs>for the OCI solution, do you have an open source solution available that I can use with something like uh, Hugging Face Accelerator or something? Uh, that, that, that is not something that's like open generally. It's more an optimization we've made as part of the delivering our platform, but we kind of wanted to share the, the thought process. Um, and Marwan's got something to yeah. add. In general, like Aorus makes it super easy for you to build your own clients on top. The reason it's not open source is because it's very like specific on like how we're you know packaging things and there's a dependency how you're exporting and then downloading but the library apis are like the docs are super well and, like i'm happy to connect after if you don't give me any guidance thank you thank you cool first of all thank you for the talk that was very uh very well presented very informative um so obviously i guess you guys are deploying into kind of customer clouds as well as on-prem so for the customer cloud scenario, uh, auto scaling performance seems to be pretty important, right? Because you don't want people paying for GPUs that are just sitting there downloading weights. Uh, so do you guys have like numbers around that that you'd be able to share, or has like using the OCI registry to download the weights uh, did that improve? You know, based like versus using something like Blob Storage? Yeah, I think we got the numbers to be pretty close to our object storage in production. Um, obviously, there's the whole thing. It depends where our artifact registry is. It's in the US region, but if your customer is downloading from like AWS, there's probably like extra delays. But the numbers were like pretty close to what we have just pulling from object storage um, in our SaaS platform. Maybe if you're fine, like a two to three minute extra delay. Um, I don't think I have the official numbers off the top of my head, but the numbers are pretty close. And I think the gains made it worth it for us to you know, incur that cost. Gotcha. And is that like after the node is already provisioned in the cluster? Is that including node auto scaling as well? Yeah. So the it depends on which model. So for certain models like the generative large ones, we have an abstraction like the NFS cache. So you, you only get the penalty on first download. Um, for the smaller embed models, you download per you know model service start. Um, so sorry, I lost your question. <laughs> Say it again. Yeah. So I guess. Uh, I was wondering if that those numbers, like you know, three to four minutes, uh, were including kind of node oh, no, acquisition this is specifically time. Model weights. Okay, yeah. just model weights. Yeah, cool. and then okay. we download the model weights because it's you know Triton needs to have them yeah, first yeah. before loading to memory. Awesome, yeah. thank you so much. Thanks. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. I really like the idea of putting the model weights in OCI, but it's not very clear to me how you actually download those. Uh, is this something you do? You have to do you you have to code in your inference server? I mean. Use a client library to download those. So the question being how we how we actually do the download? Yeah. In the downloader. Yeah. yeah. So we have an we have an init container. Um, the init container is effectively just an Aorus client, and then you know you pass it inputs, outputs, and it just calls Aorus, like you know the Aorus API pull, which does the pull from the you know OCI registry. So we have an init container as part of the you know inference server. It runs first, and then the inference server starts up when the model weights are downloaded locally. Okay. Thanks. 
Hey, good talk. I was wondering, um, when you break the model into layers, I was wondering, do you actually do like the, the layers literally like the model layers, each is one layer um, of the data, or is there better ways of doing that, particularly with fine tuning? It, it depends on the, the model itself. Like obviously some of them are, are multiple layers, some of them are single layer, that kind of thing. But yeah, with the, the larger ones, we kind of break it up, not like every layer, but uh, yeah, roughly. Yeah. Roughly, we utilize layers. I don't know if you have anything. Is there any like research into optimizations um, for? Uh, I would say we haven't done done a lot on that again because uh, there's there's kind of other larger larger order problems to solve right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no numbers we can specifically share. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm wondering. I'm I'm not sure if this is a part of the challenges you face, but do you uh, can you comment on um, how do you strike the balance between um, throughput and latency if you employ batching of the LLM inferences? Uh, you mean at runtime? Yeah. Or, ah. In the runtime. Um, I'm actually, we can chat with you offline. Yeah. But like that's, but yeah, that's kind of a little outside of the scope of what what's the challenges are okay, for yeah. delivering Sounds privately. Good. But yeah, feel free to come up. <laughs> and we've got like. Uh, I have a question uh, about the performance. Uh, the OCI and uh, Warras is a great idea, and how, to, how do you compare it between like ours and other storage systems like TCA? Uh, I think, yeah, we answered that earlier. It, it was very close performance, and even the little hit we got from you know switching from object storage to an OCI artifact in those scenarios, it was worth it because it's just it's vendor neutral. You can run it anywhere. So, so the main benefit be, is sorry. The main benefit or advantage is from phone OCI is what, what is the advantage? I think encryption, I think being vendor neutral were like big things for us because we don't really need to worry about any specific things in object storage as well as also enabling air gapped. The performance is very similar and the little hits we get, I think given the benefits we've gained, it was worth it. I got you. Thanks. Yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, my question is specifically about the uh, model caching for downloads, right? I'm curious about the, the NFS setup, uh, assuming and any consideration slash optimizations you had to work with to make it super fast. I'm actually going to take that and like recommend the same thing because we've okay. got the rest of our team over here. And so sure. we would love to answer that, but it's uh, a little bit outside of like the private deployments themselves. Yeah, thanks. Hey, thanks so much for sharing. Everything was 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 real awesome what you guys shared. Um, curious on the GPU layer part of it. For the on-prem, are, are you using like like Dell or HP servers with NVIDIA GPUs or are you using something like DGX where something like base command might help you with some of that? Are you speaking about like our SaaS system and like what we use for, for our specific servers? For the or? stuff on-prem, yeah. I mean, you, you showed some of the examples where you were running things in either Amazon or, or Google, yeah. but part of it was going to be to run it on-prem. I'm, I'm just trying to press around some of the NVIDIA, some of the NVIDIA marketing stuff about on DGX claims that base command is going to solve things like what you guys solved for. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm just trying to ping around what your experience with that was, or if you were just using like Dell or HP servers on prem and, and like the, the base command wasn't relevant. Yeah, I would say uh, a lot of the on-prem examples, like I can't share too much just because they're sure, very sure. customer. Sure, sure, that's proprietary, I get it. Yeah, it's, it's customer specific, right? And so when we're doing that, it's kind of whatever that particular uh, particular customer is bringing to us and we're just engaging with them to say, okay, how do we make sure that the, the GPUs are like registered appropriately Got it. with the, the cluster that we're running our system on. Okay, so thank you. So we see a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you all, appreciate it.